It's your time. No? And we have two speakers today. Uh, first is Melissa Ewell. She is coming back for how, what time now? How many times? This will be number three. Number three. <laughs> and probably we're going to see her again. <laughs> Uh, Melissa was a music educator for 45 years at the, and most recently held the position as pianist for the music department at BFA. Those 45 years and before include countless performances as accompanists for recitals, chorus concerts, festivals, masters, class, musical theater, operas, and auditions. <laughs> Melissa has a master's degree in arts education from St. Michael's and is currently a collaborative pianist with Solaris Vocal Ensemble. Would you tell us a little bit about Solaris? Yeah, Solaris is a, a semi-professional chorus based in Burlington. Um, well, their home base, their art, their home base in terms of rehearsals and performances, the College Street Congregational Church. Oh, nice. So that's where we uh, we rehearsed last night. Um, we rehearse once a week and then do programs through the roughly the academic calendar. So um, we have coming up November 5th, we're going to be at, uh, well, I still call it VPR. I don't know about you guys. I, <laughs> <laughs> I cannot get on board It's still VPR. <laughs> so we have an uh, afternoon session at VPR on November 5th, um, where we are going to be recording for a future broadcast um, at some point, and it includes two world premieres by two Vermont composers. So, um, so that, and then we have a big Christmas concert in December. So, yeah, busy, busy. So, yeah. And with her today is Holly Rich. Did I do that last week? Great. Last it's okay. <laughs> She's a music educator from Fairfax, although originally from Eastern Pennsylvania. She's been living in Northern Vermont for almost 10 years, homeschooling mom, the elementary music teacher for the Davis Community School in Burlington, and a private music teacher and vocal performer. In the past 15 years, she has performed opera, musical theater, and classical voice across stages in Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, and Vermont. As a music educator, she teaches classroom music, voice, piano, guitar, ukulele, choir, musical theater, world percussion, you'll have to define that, <laughs> and more. As a homeschooler mom, she teaches her wonderfully inquisitive first and third grade daughters. Please join me in first time welcome to Holly Rich. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of background information about the people whose music we're going to be performing for you today. And, you know, this is all a strategy because then, like, in between songs when I have to retune, and I'll talk more about that, then Holly will take over the talking. So, <laughs> um, so this is my one, my one big blurb here. So, um, so here we go. Uh, Jews probably arrived in Spain in Roman times. The Iberian Peninsula is called Sephirot in Hebrew. So the Spanish Jews have come to be called the Sephardim, or in Spanish, Sephardi. The Muslim conquering of Spain resulted in a golden age of Sephardic learning, art, and literature. The Sephardim were important as doctors, astronomers, and poets, the most famous probably being Maimonides, um, for whom there is a medical center, I think, in New York City. I think there's a well-known medical center, the Maimonides Hospital. Um, and Maimonides lived from 1135 to 1204. But when Christians came to power again in Spain, there was no tolerance for other beliefs. And in 1492, under the rule of Ferdinand and Isabella, you know, the Columbus guy, <laughs> an edict of expulsion was issued for all Muslims and Jews who would not convert. They had 30 days to leave the country or be executed. They could take nothing with them but what they were wearing. After the expulsion, the Sephardim resettled in Turkey, Egypt, North Africa, the Balkans, Rhodes, Germany, England, the Low Countries, Southern France, and Italy. Some ultimately made their way to America and settled in New Mexico and Colorado. The Sephardim who stayed in Spain and converted were called conversos, their lives were no easier than the lives of the Jews who fled, for they were always under suspicion of practicing Judaism in secret, which apparently many of them did. And for the most part, 
they were not allowed to leave Spain, ever. In 1992, King Juan Carlos offered an official apology for the expulsion, and since that time, there has been a rising feeling of pride in the Sephardic contribution to Spanish history and culture. So because of all this great sorrow, it's a culture that's so rich with deep emotions running through their music. They speak to all aspects of the human condition. There's great joy you'll hear today, great sorrow, deep love, deep loss. We're going to get started with her singing with, and playing. We're going to get started with her music. Um, the first song isn't too emotional yet, um, but it can be seen as a cautionary tale, warning about the dangers of laziness. It speaks about a king and his three daughters two of whom work diligently, and one who fell asleep at her work. The mother gets very angry and drives her on. Whether she drives her away or whether she just drives her to keep working, that can be up to your interpretation. Um, I believe you, most of you have a sheet of the translation, so you can follow along while we're singing, while I'm singing and she's playing, so you can kind of see what's going on in the song.
There's the moment where Oz peeks out behind the curtain. Like, I think Toto pulls the curtain aside. And you see the man behind the curtain. So um, this is where I say, ignore the man behind the curtain, because I have to retune a few notes in order for us to do our next couple of songs. These harps, these lever harps, are very different than the big concert harp you see, which has essentially all the notes of a piano. You, um, and you change sharps and flats with the foot pedals on those things. So you don't have to retune. retune. But for, uh, for me to be able to add, for example, the G sharps that we need in our next couple of pieces, I actually have to retune the notes. So this is where I, you know, the invisible curtain, and I have the man behind the curtain tuning, and Holly's going to do some talking while I do a quick retune. <laughs> so first we're going to start off talking about the language probably noticed I wasn't singing in English. So the language that you are hearing today, it's commonly, commonly called Ladino, although more properly, Judaism. It's based largely on the 15th century Castilian Spanish, with a sprinkling of Hebrew, Arabic, Greek, and some Turkish. There have been two major dialects, the Eastern Judeo-Spanish and the Western or North African Judeo-Spanish. Recently, the North African dialect has essentially ceased to exist. The Eastern has fared better, as there are programs in Israel that are currently striving to keep it alive. Also, some Sephardim brought the Eastern dialect to, dialect to the U.S. in the 20th century, to New Mexico, Colorado, and there is also a group in New York. As a vocalist, I want to do a good job pronoun pronouncing these well and properly, but I had such a struggle trying to find a pronunciation guide that was complete. I contact, I found one online and it was, had some things on it and left a whole lot of things out. So I contacted the Center for Sephardic Studies through the University of Washington in Washington State and they helped me. They sent a more complete pronunciation guide, but there are still some things that, some combinations of letters that in here I really don't know how to pronounce them properly. So I'm doing the best I can. Um, I took some vocal diction classes in college, so I'm relying on some of that vocal diction from Spanish, but then I also took one semester of Hebrew, so between that, I'm trying my best to, to, pronounce, to pronounce these to the best of my ability and to the best of anyone's known ability. Um, I even asked if I could like send them the songs, can they like critique them? I just don't know enough that we could really give you accurate, and we don't know. Where was that song from? Where was that song from? Which dialect was even spoken, was spoken where the song came from? And so much of it is lost. And that's one of the reasons we're doing this project is so that we can help make this more well-known so it has less of a chance of being lost to the things that we know. Good. <laughs> Guess we forgot to turn the phone on. So 
that is one thing I did wish I knew more, was where did these songs originate? I just don't know. We have this wonderful collection from Samuel Milligan, and he gathered nine of the, nine of the songs, but I don't know which ones came from where. So I'll sing with my very best understanding, and I know you guys will be very understanding if I mispronounce something wrong since you won't know it. <laughs> Here we go with lots of big emotions. Hank, he's ready for these next two songs. The first one is a very, very sad song, a bitter song about a broken heart. Think about who you would be telling this to. Your mother, when she bore you and brought you into this world, did not give you a heart with which to love another person. <laughs> Goodbye, beloved. I don't want to live. You have made me bitter. <laughs> John to tell the audience to bring hankies today because they're, you know, like Holly said, these songs are so full of emotion. I mean, I, I used to think that you couldn't beat the Irish or Scottish for a sad air, but the Sephardic songs, it, I mean, it makes those songs look positively cheerful. So um, these are these are so deeply felt, and that's one of the things we've enjoyed so much about working with them.
Hanky, the next one's even worse. <laughs> so this one's a sad song about love again, but this time it's the love of a mother and her dead daughter. And in it's a very intense lament of this grieving mother. In the Sephardic culture, it was even traditional for a man to sing this song because it was considered bad luck if it was sung by a woman. The arranger of these songs, Samuel Hillary, specifically notes that this stems from a desire, no doubt, to avoid tempting fate. But on a lighter note, for those of you who are musicians, you are going to be hearing in a lot of these songs the harmonic minor or that raised seventh note that gives it the distinctive Roma or Romani sound that you that you hear.
size. Yes. <laughs> okay, man behind the curtain again, Ty. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the oral traditions of the Sephardic culture. There is a very strong oral tradition there for songs, stories, etc. As when they were forced to leave, they were allowed nothing with them. So that is a huge part of their culture. As the Sephardim was so spread out, the oral, oral literature has been influenced by so many diverse cultural traditions in the regions where they settled. Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hispanic, Mediterranean, Near Eastern. Some of the songs, there are lyric songs in this culture called cantigas. There are also some narrative ballads called romanzas, which those can embody a variety of subjects. Um, prisoners and captives, the husbands return from away, faithful or tragic love, the unfortunate wife, various amorous adventures, tricks and deceptions. There are also lots of songs of communal functions, such as births, weddings, funerals, and such. Additionally, found in the Sephardic culture are cumulative or enumerative songs, such as the Song of the Moorish Girl, which includes a verse about a fly, and then a spider, and then a mouse, then a dog, then, or, sorry, then a cat, then a dog, then a snake, then fire, then water, and then finally an ox. Does it remind anyone of I know an old lady who swallowed a fly? <laughs> There's another song that we know of called Viva Buena, and that was sung at weddings. The singers acted out mime gestures, miming the various stages of the production of bread, starting from sowing, and then irrigating, growing, reaping, gathering, grinding, sifting, kneading, molding, baking. Um, this song was a metaphor for fertility in the marriage ceremony. So the next song you'll hear is a sweet lullaby, which they also have, from a mother to her baby boy. She's singing him to sleep, talking of, he, of how he will go study the law when he's older. Not like, you're gonna go be a lawyer. Not that type of thing. <laughs> it is my understanding in this, in ancient Jewish cultures, you had to, as you were a boy growing up, you studied the law or the Torah, the first five books of the Jewish and Christian Bible, and you kind of had to pass an exam of sorts to be able to become a man. So this was more like, you're going to grow up and learn and go to school, and you will become a respected person in this community. So it's a mother just wishing the very best for her son, whom he loves, whom she loves, and he will love her too. <laughs> the second song is a song of adoring love, of, oh, she has a sigh, I see an angel. And then contrasted with the third song in the set, which is about stinging, painful love.
So we're going to start with the riddle, do a couple proverbs. So, does anyone here speak Spanish or know a little bit of Spanish? Yeah, here, I'll, I'll read it for you, and then I'll give the translation for everyone else, so you can see if you can figure out at least what the riddle means, and then we'll figure out things. So, una cosa y cosa maravillosa, hay en la mara y la moya. So that means something, something marvelous. It falls into the sea and does not get wet. Think about it. What could fall into the sea and not get wet? Yeah. The sun. El sol. El sol. <laughs> nice work. Okay. Here are some lovely proverbs. Grano a grano, quince la gallina en la papa. One seed at a time, a hen fills its crop. Antes que te cases, mira lo que cases. 
That means watch out what you do before you get married. <laughs> Just another one. Dime con quien andas, dime quien sos. Tell me who you go around with, and I'll tell you who you are. Mi nuera la garita, disque que lava desfoyina. That one means my bright daughter-in-law. After she washes, she decides to clean the chimney. <laughs> and then, our favorite. Que no tiene a la fermosa, beze a la mocosa. He who doesn't have a beautiful girl must kiss a snot-nosed one. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this next song, there is a yearning pain of being separated from the one you love. Come quickly, my love, come quickly to me or I may die. May seem a little dramatic, but I mean, we've probably all been there. <laughs>
The next song, we need your help. <laughs> No, I'm not a <laughs> It's really fun, so don't get worried about it. Do you want a frog instead? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so the frogs you can either tap or scrape the bumps on the back of the frog. Yeah, you can do that. Or you can just tap them. So. forgotten and lost. We have this exciting song we saved for last. It's a celebration. It's a joyous celebration of a new baby boy. In the Jewish tradition, all male babies were circumcised, and it was a very important symbol of the culture's renewed covenant with God. A new baby is a big deal anyway, and then at this cultural significance, it's just a big party. So we've got to practice. <laughs> We've practiced a lot. You guys haven't practiced yet, so we'll do a little bit of practicing. So essentially, the main goal is to watch me. So, <laughs> we're going to do a little bit, and we're going to be playing on the offbeat, for those of you who are musicians. So we're going to do something like that. Follow along with your wrists. that and then I'm gonna stop and you have to stop when I stop. This song ready? <laughs> the song is full of starts and stops. It is. So now so if you want to stop and you keep playing, there's no penalty for that. <laughs> We're not gonna send you to detention. <laughs> but it does start and stop, which is just the nature of the song. So your best bet is to just watch your intrepid leader here. So okay. let's do a couple of those stop practices. Ready? And I'll try to like nod, nod, so you know that like nod, nod is the end of, of it. Let's do it a couple more times. Sometimes it might be quicker, sometimes it might be longer. <laughs> You're welcome to join me because I'll be like, and you'll know and hit it. But that's like just one time. Those are bonus hits. Bonus right. Hits, so. <laughs> and just basically have fun with it. This would right. be this would this is a song of celebration. We're just having We're fun. Just, this is just strictly for fun. So um, <laughs> there we are. <laughs> okay, everybody ready out there? Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. 
I was gobsmacked. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Never wanted anything in my life. So, of course, I didn't play the harp. And I wasn't about to have it sitting in my living room going unplayed. So, I took lessons with Heidi Soons, who is the um, principal harpist for the Vermont Symphony Orchestra. And my goal was to, I had some upcoming travel to Ireland and Scotland, and my goal was to go over there and buy some music and bring it back and just play for myself just for my own enjoyment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but because I didn't choose this harp, it chose me, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little big for me. I have very short arms, so reaching those bass strings, which are wonderful and resonant, is on like... <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, it became clear over time, because the harp, and Dimi knows this, the harp is not really great for your body. It's not a very ergonomic instrument. You've got your elbows like this, and your shoulders tend to want to do this, and they're not supposed to do that. <laughs> so um, it became apparent I needed a smaller instrument. So I downsized to a 28 string. You lose the lovely bass, but that is so much easier to play. <laughs> I can reach all the strings on that one. So. Um, but they're both considered folk harps. They're lever harps without the pedals. Um, you would not see these in a big symphony orchestra. They're meant for a more intimate, because um, they don't make a big sound, they're meant for a more intimate setting. So, um, yeah, I'm lucky that I have two. Yeah. Is it a coincidence that this happened on Long uh, we didn't plan it that way. way. It just was the date that, I mean, John gave us a few dates, and this is the one that worked for both of us. So. I'd be happy to take credit for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so you might have noticed in a couple of places, um, if you're watching my fingers, that I played very close down to the soundboard a couple times. And that's a technique called, um, it's a French term, it's called près de la table close to the table, and it means, and it, it changes the sound of the strings. So you have more of a guitar sound if you play close to the soundboard. So if you just want to change up your piece a little bit and, you know, give it a little extra interest, um, then you can do that where it's appropriate. So, and then there's a couple spots where I was doing some staccato notes, which are detached notes, and using the side of my finger for that. And that's kind of an uncommon technique, um, but it was, Sam Milligan, who arranged these, put it into these pieces. So. Yeah, OK. Any, any other questions? One more question for our speakers. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.